All right. So we move on to maternal infections. We're going to talk about each of these infections, um, some of which are more familiar than others. HIV, actually, we know all about HIV, right? Whether pregnant or not, um, it's the same disease, uh, the same uh, infection. Um, the issue is an HIV positive person, when are they seroconverting? What are their, um, vi what's their viral load like? All right, what kind of medications can we give them to try to keep that viral load down? They are more prone to other infections um, when they are HIV positive. So these are all the things to consider. We work closely with um, infectious disease docs. Um, uh, OB and infectious diseases work close in monitoring viral load. And we, um, they are put on a cocktail of medications that are safe for pregnancy. Um, and a lot of HIV positive women do very well um, during pregnancy. Um, the end of the pregnancy um, the, will depend on the viral load. So we'll watch it carefully. Uh, we will induce or give a C-section if the viral load gets too high. Um, we have found that a C-section um, is not warranted if the viral load is like under 1,000 or something like that. Um, because the risk of mother to baby transmission is higher with surgical delivery and the complications to mom are higher with a surgical delivery. So we will, we will deliver vaginally. Um, during labor, mom receives ret, uh, retrovir or you know the antiviral uh, um, medication um, during pregnancy as well as during labor, okay? Keep in mind, uh, HIV and HIPAA, meaning privacy issues, are huge. So you better have HIV med label on an IV bag covered. I mean, nobody, it's not gonna say HIV medication. But anyone who knows anything about a, uh, HIV may recognize the name of a drug that's on that IV bag. And any patient might have a visitor who might look up and see that label. Cool. You're going to be screwed if that's your patient. All right? I tell you this because we learned in the profession the hard way. So I'm, not me personally. I read it in an article where the hospital was liable for a breach of privacy because they did not cover the IV bag that had an HIV medication in it. So I'm passing it along to you. So that's kind of weird because you're supposed to label everything. Oh yeah, you can label it. Just cover it with a... Uh, uh, you would cover it. Some chemotherapy drugs and different drugs are light sensitive. You put the bag over it. Something like that. Yep. I'm not telling you not to label it. I'm telling you to cover the label in some way. Just think about mother-baby transmission. With these medications, if we follow the guidelines that we've established over the years um, um, of HIV care, um, we can eliminate mother-to-baby transmission of the virus. I think that's, uh, that's pretty outstanding, if you ask me. Um, but there's things that we have to avoid, episiotomies. We're not gonna do a fetal scalp electro, we're not gonna do any sort of internal monitoring, all right? We're not going, we're going to um, avoid vacuum extractions or uh, forceps deliveries that will increase the risk of lacerations to either mother or baby. You hear what I'm saying? We're gonna eliminate those, or uh, we're gonna minimize those risks. Once the baby's born, we're going to bathe that baby thoroughly before we stick a needle in his thigh. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so we are going to start the baby on a baby dose of um, retrovir for six weeks following um, delivery. If all of that is done and there, there's very, very, very likely not going to be mother to baby transmission of HIV. Six 
Um, there's some issues, uh, there's other issues with HIV. It all is surrounding how they have got to be HIV positive in the first place. Are there some lifestyle issues that put them at higher risk for other complications? I had a patient who was, worked in healthcare and found out she was HIV positive with her prenatal labs. She was not a high risk patient in any other way. She did not have a high risk lifestyle other than her profession. And uh, she did very well and went on to have a couple of kids. Um, so in her case, there was some counseling for the family, you know, the couple who had discovered this kind of the hard way. Um, for others, it's social issues. Um, it all depends on uh, the origin of the disease. Um, not everyone who gets HIV is a um, multiple uh, drug abusing hooker, if you will. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, all it takes is an exposure, how whatever that exposure is, right? Um, so uh, deal with whatever um, is surrounding that diagnosis. Blah, blah, blah. All that. Retrovir, I mentioned that. In, um, in labor and um, with baby. Torch infections. Torch is a group of infections um, that you either have or you don't have. There's nothing we can do about them, really. Um, but know about them and be prepared for anything, uh, any complications they might uh, present. So TORCH stands for toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm smart. Mm -hmm. All right, so depending on when these viruses uh, are active, there are uh, some, like we'll say cytomegalovirus. You could have had cytomegalovirus years before you got pregnant. During pregnancy, it can um, re-manifest or like, kind of like shingles and chicken pox, I guess. Um, it can, whatever, uh, the latent virus can reactivate. Um, so depending on when these viruses are active in the body um, during pregnancy or if they are, will depend on what complications um, happen. Sometimes it's early in the pregnancy that causes the complication. Sometimes it's late in the pregnancy. Like with rubella, for instance, if a woman is rubella positive, in active rubella infection at the end of her pregnancy, so when she goes to deliver, we have a, a, a active rubella infection with mother. Guess who else has an active rubella infection? Baby. baby. So both mom and baby are going to be uh, in an isolation room together. Um, but we're not bringing that actively infected baby into a nursery full of other babies who aren't immune, right? Isn't that like mandated by law that they test for torch? Uh, we, not mandated by law for torch per se, rubella, yes. We do chest, check for rubella. I don't know why. Actually, back in, when I first got married, my first marriage, we were still doing blood tests um, before marriage license. Mm -hmm. Um, we were checking for syphilis and rubella. And I don't know what they were going to do if they found one. I guess with the... So the man got syphilis checked. The woman got syphilis and rubella checked. I don't know. Uh, so so if I guess we have syphilis. We have to get checked, uh, treated. If I was not immune, did I have to get a shot? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is, um, I guess that was going on the um, assumption that you were waiting to get pregnant until after you got married. That was that. That's where all that came in. I'm pretty sure they don't do uh, blood tests anymore before getting your marriage license. But that's what was being checked. So prenatally, we do check for rubella. Um, sometimes we might check if there was, if uh, particularly if there's a concern about an active infection. We might check for, for um, cytomegalovirus. 
Um, but there's no good that can come from knowing about toxoplasmosis or cytomegalovirus, particularly cytomegalovirus. If you knew you had it before, all you're going to do is stress about it reactivating in your system because there's nothing we can do about it. What we can do is avoid the high-risk behaviors. And when I say high-risk, I mean changing a litter box. All right. So toxoplasmosis um, is found in cat poop. So avoid it. Raw meat. All right. Um, I have not uh, changed the cat box in 26 years. Just in case. Right. <laughs> Just in case, folks. We don't want... Actually, I don't have a cat, so it's easy. <laughs> That's what toxoplasmosis can do um, to your baby. Yeah. That's herpes. Herpes, um, we can actually try to suppress herpes. Uh, we know... You, oftentimes we know ahead of time um, if somebody has herpes, genital herpes in particular. Um, so uh, we will... Uh, Treat any outbreaks during pregnancy, by all means. I mean, we'll put um, a woman on suppression therapy starting at the 36th week. If she has an active uh, lesion or a suspected lesion, like out, starting to out, break out, at the time of labor, there's nothing we can do to treat that, but we will avoid delivering vaginally, and we'll actually do a C-section for any suspected or actual herpes lesions. Because that's what happens to a baby who comes in contact with an active herpes lesion. Rubella, see these, uh, toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, you think, ooh, these are terrible diseases that cause terrible things. Well, they, they're pretty mild in terms of symptoms, though. You know, they kind of that flu-like malaise, achiness. It's not... Like, they might not even know you have toxoplasmosis until it's too late. So it's just a lot of education to avoid the, the virus, if you can, during pregnancy or otherwise. And we talked about groupie strep way, way back in the beginning, right? Um, groupie strep is uh, the only thing that makes a person high risk for groupie strep is that they're pregnant and they're 36, 37 weeks pregnant. We're going to test everyone. I've seen it across all socioeconomic um, back, uh, you know, very, you know, backgrounds, all races, all cultures. I've seen it in all, all kinds of people. So um, there's no risk factor other than maybe you had it with your last pregnancy, which means the normal flora in your body have just multiplied more than we want, um, and you're testing positive again, all right? Um, if you are GBS negative, but you have prolonged rupture of membranes, we might treat you as if you have GBS because you, everyone has groupie strep as a normal flora, all right? So if your membranes are ruptured for too long, we might just start giving you some penicillin so that Nothing just gets up there and starts causing trouble, all right? There are some, like, less than 20 years old. I, I don't know what that, well, how that risk factor makes sense, but this, we're going on statistics. Uh, so we're going to test everyone 36 to 37 weeks pregnant, everyone. Um, we are going to, uh, for those allergic to penicillin, we're going to do culture and sensitivity. Um, to find out um, if they are positive, um, what um, drug um, the virus is, uh, or the bacteria is sensitive to. Um, otherwise, you're getting a whopping dose of penicillin, 5 million units IV. Um, and then every four hours during labor, 2.5 million units. It's only during labor. No sense trying to treat it ahead of time. So the issue is... We got about four hours for that five million units to cross the placenta and get to the baby. Mom doesn't really need the medication. It's the baby we're trying to get the medication to, all right? So we want to see the five million units infused and then at least one more dose at two and a half million units infused. 
What that means is that enough time has passed that the baby's received penicillin prior to birth, and the baby is protected against getting it on the way out. Um, plenty of other reasons we might give antibiotics, uh, signs and symptoms of infection, risk for infection in terms of prolonged ruptured membranes, that sort of thing. Chlamydia. It's pretty common sexually transmitted um, infection these days. Um, I see it in, I uh, used to see it when I worked in the doctor's office. I'd see kind of runs on chlamydia, which meant groups of people were kind of sharing it amongst themselves, I thought, maybe. And uh, they, like high school age kids, a whole bunch, I'd have like five different calls in a week going out to young kids. Uh, you need a big old whopping dose of this, this is Zithromax. Get everyone treated or you've been around. You know. I don't know what the activities of young folk are these days. Nonetheless, it's, an, it's a pretty easy infection to catch. It's a pretty easy infection to not, to know, to not know you have, all right? Could be asymptomatic. Some women experience a little painful urination, maybe a little bit of a discharge. Um, some guys don't even know they have it, but it's easily transferred from one to another, all right? Um, the thing about chlamydia is it's easily treated. It's one whopping dose of Zithromax, one gram of Zithromax. Partners need to be treated, protected sex, if any, uh, for the two full weeks following treatment. If they are pregnant, we are going to um, insist on a test of cure. So we're going to retest in three weeks to make sure we've um, treated it successfully. All right. We don't want mom to have chlamydia when her baby's born. We don't want mom giving chlamydia to her baby. So we had a patient who they just found out had this, and she had to have a C-section because of it. Mm -hmm. Is that the case for all of them? Or well, we hope to get to them. We text, we're actually checking the, uh, for gonorrhea and chlamydia at their initial prenatal visit. Um, and oftentimes, they're getting checked at the 28-week mark, too. Um, if they have uh, a history of the infection, they're probably getting checked pretty frequently. Our goal is to make sure that she is negative at the time of her delivery. But we'll probably check very at the time of delivery as well. If there's any question whatsoever, we are uh, doing a C-section. So yeah, Zithromax. Sometimes um, it's amoxicillin if they're allergic to Zithromax and now the big whopping dose. Um, you know the ointment we put in the baby's eyes, the erythromycin? Mm -hmm. Chlamydia is one of the things we're trying to avoid, all right? Oh, gonorrhea. It's also making a bit of a comeback. <laughs> Easily shared amongst friends. For a pregnant woman, well, we don't want her sharing that with her baby either, right? Um, so what happens here, uh, risk factors, you know, they say multiple sex partners. Honestly, it's unprotected sex with the wrong sex partner, right? It's, it takes one. That's all it takes. It's the unprotected sex part that really is the risk factor. All right? Um, but it can be asymptomatic, so you might not know you're sharing the, the uh, infection with somebody. All right? What do we do for that? We're going to give them a big old dose of Zithromax, one gram, just like we did for chlamydia. chlamydia. We're going to give them a big old shot in the butt. Ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams IM. All right, it's one of those drugs we have to um, reconstitute, and it stings like a son of a gun going in. So I reconstitute with a little lidocaine in it because I'm a nice gal. That's plain and simple. Hey, you know what? If you have gonorrhea, give me a call. I will, I'll treat you as, as best as I can with a numbing shot of ceftriaxone or rocephin and Zithromax, okay? 
and we will test we will test again to make sure we are effective in our treatment and we'll probably test several times to make sure that come delivery time we have a negative culture we can actually find it through an endocervical culture or a urine culture we can detect it in both yes um, the last thing on that slide said to treat all sexual partners correct we're talking about HIV, so it's we are not obligated to contact the sexual partners they are is there any case where we are the ones who would let a partner know mm -mm. never nope not even HIV wow. yeah put you in a pretty that's a very good comment put you in a pretty tough position when we know a person is HIV positive and it's clear we have strict instructions not to discuss HIV um, in front of the partner, family, everybody. No writing it on the whiteboard. No writing it on the whiteboard. Yeah, I would definitely say no writing it on the whiteboard. Um, everyone knows about yeast, right? Yeast infections. Do I need to go over that? Wanted to take a bottle brush. <laughs> to the area. Anyone? <laughs> Amen. It's a heck of a way to end a uh, lecture for that, but hold on. <laughs>